Well, my name is Tyler, and uh, I serve as the youth pastor here at the church, work primarily with 6th through 12th graders, and uh, it's my great joy to do that. This last Wednesday, we were at Merge at the fair, and if you've ever taken 40 students to the Monroe Fairgrounds, it's like herding cats, um, you know, and uh, it was so much fun. Uh, so much life and, uh, and just a real joy. Well, this morning we're going to continue on our series called Seven Letters, and we're going to be looking at the church at Sardis. But just want you to think, uh, how are you when you wake up in the morning? How are, no, no, not what you want me to think. How are you really when you wake up in the morning? Some of you wake up and you feel beautiful. Like you just stretch and you're like, I am beautiful. Uh, others, you wake up and you are excited for the day. Like you can't wait to tackle it. You, your alarm goes off and you're like, yes, it's Monday. But if you're like me, you wake up like this. Oh, sleep was so good, and it was interrupted so much. Um, they say you need sleep to live, right? I'm here to tell you that's not true. We have a daughter that's about to turn one, and she does not like sleeping at night. She likes to party. And, uh, and so I'm here to tell you that you can go 11 months in a week and not sleep and, uh, and be perfectly okay. Um, but each day you wake up, it's really a chance at life. It's a chance that you can make that day count. But just because you're awake doesn't mean you're alive. I am a hard sleeper. Like hard sleeper. There is times my wife has says, do you remember me waking you up last night? Uh-uh, I don't. She's like, I literally was on my knees with both hands rolling you back and forth. I was like, I slept really good last night. Can you do that every night for me? Uh, just kind of rock me to sleep. Um, but I'm a really hard sleeper, um, and, and, and so there's, it takes a lot to wake me up. And there's times when I wake up and I say things or even I do things and I don't remember them. And so just because you're awake doesn't mean... You're fully alive. But what makes you feel alive? Like what are those moments in life where you feel like your best self, where you feel the most alive? For some of you, maybe it's taking a trail to the top of a mountain peak, which I just want to give a big shout out to our children's pastor, Pastor Jolene. What she does and how she's like changed her life is crazy. She just finished a 65-mile hike on the Pacific Crest Trail, encountered two bears. Both bears ran away from her, praise God. And, um, and, you know, and she did an amazing thing. So when you see her, congratulate her. Maybe it's going to the concert of your favorite band. I know there was a Foo Fighter in concert last night. I don't know what a Foo is, but I think we should all fight it. And, um, you know, and I know that's a big deal. Maybe it's getting to a tropical location and hearing the waves crash and your toes in the sand. Maybe that's when you feel most alive. Maybe it's heading to your favorite store in the mall, knowing you have a little extra money uh, to spend. Maybe it's watching your kids play sports and seeing them learn and excel and achieve things. Maybe it's getting together with friends over an awesome meal. But whatever it is, what makes you say, this is living? It changes at different seasons of life as well. There was a time for me when it was playing sports when I felt most alive. There was a time for me when it was cheering for sports that I felt most alive. And there's times when hunting was when I feel most alive. But now with a little girl, everything's changed. One of my buddies here says, whatever your top ten moments were in life, once you have kids, they slowly soon to be all replaced by moments with them. And I'm like... That is so true. Right now, I feel most alive. Uh, our little girls learn to give hugs. Oh, they are the best. She'll throw herself on my shoulder, and she'll take her right hand, and she'll pat me on the back. I'm like, whatever our plans were today, they're canceled until you're done. Until you're done, you can just keep patting me on the back. And then she learned to give kisses. 
We call them loves. And we go, can you give daddy loves? And she just smiles and then opens her mouth as wide as she can and just leans in. It was really cool until the other day she licked my nose. I'm like, okay, okay, I'm drawing a line there. But uh, whatever it was, like whatever makes you feel most alive, we have those moments. And today we're going to be looking at the church at Sardis, which is a lesson on becoming fully alive. And we've been going through this series looking at these seven letters found in the book of Revelation to seven different churches. And these letters were written to churches and addressing problems that can encourage us today to be better followers of Jesus. But as we prepare to read from Revelation chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, let me give you a little background about Sardis, a.k.a. the church of the living dead. Now, this is not, oh, some heads popped up there. They're like, oh, zombies? Apocalypse? No, it's not what this is uh, right here. But literally, it, it could be called the church of the living dead. But it's not the case of a zombie apocalypse. They're a church that was soft, that lacked discipline, and their, and their dedication wavered. And it was the doom of Sardis. And when Jesus spoke these words for John to write down, the city of Sardis had already seen its best days and had started to, cl- to decline. Yet it was still a wealthy city. The first coins actually ever minted in Asia Minor came from the town of Sardis. And it's where modern currency was actually born. And the combination of easy money and loose morals made the people of Sardis notoriously soft and pleasure-loving and pleasure-seeking. And the church in Sardis was more severely denounced than all of the other churches. It was dying and decaying, but yet Jesus will challenge this church to come alive. And today, Jesus wants you to come alive. He wants you to be fully alive and have life fully found in him. And we're going to look at the scripture, and at the end, we want to have the chance to respond. And maybe you're here today, and you haven't started a relationship with Jesus. Your best life is found in giving your whole life to him. Maybe you've been on a journey with Jesus for a long time, but maybe it doesn't have the life that it used to have. Jesus wants to revitalize your heart and soul and bring you fully back to life. But let's read here in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. It says this, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds, and you have a reputation of being alive. But you are dead. Wake up! Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. And the one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This morning we're going to break this uh, scripture into sections and talk about how Jesus wants us to be fully alive. The first thing we see here is this word reputation that I want to focus on. And if you've looked at this, if you've been on this journey with us, the the way that Jesus has talked to these churches is he's brought a truth about himself. He's brought an encouragement. He's brought... uh, a correction, and then he's talked about the reward. If you look at this passage, he still talks about himself when talking about the fullness of Jesus and, and the seven stars and, and in the completeness of him, but he skips the encouragement. Jesus has nothing good to say about this church. That's not a good place to be. But he has nothing good to say. He goes immediately to the reputation He says, I know your deeds. He's not pulling any punches. You see, who you are and what you do is never hidden from Jesus. Who you are and what you do is never hidden from Jesus. You see, this church had a reputation 
In their city, it would have been known as a happening church. They probably had good music, a good preacher. They probably even did a donut Sunday. Uh, They had life groups, activities, and action. But you can't escape this phrase. You have this reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Have you ever had someone say something to you that just cut through all the fluffiness of life and just went straight to your heart and you're like, ouch, that hurts, but it's true. And, and, and Jesus is speaking to this church and saying, everyone thinks this of you, but I know the truth. You're dead. And not just like kind of dead, like dead, dead, decaying. And so he speaks this truth. Um, This church maintained the impression that all was well and everyone was happy, but the church was dead. There was no struggle. There was no fight. And there was no living out the gospel that made a difference in their community. In our culture, there's this pressure to be okay. Have you ever someone come up and ask you, how are you doing? And you say, okay, but really nothing's okay? Man, I've been there. Why? Because I don't really want to get into what's going on. I don't really want to talk about my hurts, my struggles, how life is challenging. But have you ever gone up to someone and you've been like, how are you doing? And they just totally broke down and you weren't prepared for that? It's awkward on both ends, isn't it? You're like, how are you doing? And it's just like tears and you're like, oh, yeah, my 11 o'clock's here. Um, Gotta go. Um, But, you know, but we have this pressure to be okay. But the truth is, the thing that makes us more like each other than anything else is the fact that we're not okay. The fact that we're all broken. The fact that we're all hurting. The fact that we're all struggling with something in life. And your struggle is as real to you as my struggle is as real to me. And some people may think in the devil lie that you've got it harder than everyone else. There are some things that appear harder, but your struggle is the hardest thing you will face. And, 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 it's, and it's okay to not be okay. The thing that we have most in common is the thing we try to hide the most. My heart's been heavy this week for a couple reasons. One, there was a young pastor, 30 years old, led a large church in California, battled depression, anxiety, and he ended up on uh, a week and a half ago on Friday taking his life at the church. Man, that broke my heart. Broke my heart because he has a wife and three young boys. Broke my heart because he did youth ministry in Redmond before he went down there. Broke my heart because he's 30 years old. Man, it just weighs on me. Just weighs on me. Broke my heart because there was a friend who I talked to that marriage had dissolved and just had no idea that things were even struggling there, and and the wife had filed for divorce. Talked with one of my former students who, uh, as soon as he graduated high school, went into the Marines and just excelled and actually became a Marine sniper. And, like, that's what he wanted to be, and excelled and excelled, but just felt like his heart was changing. Because before he went in, I said, hey, the Marines can shape you, but don't let them shape your heart. Keep it soft. Keep it tender. And he called me and said, my heart's not soft. It's hardened. And I had to get out, but I'm scared. I said, buddy, you're a Marine sniper. What are you scared of? And he's like, in the Marines, I wasn't scared of anything. But now getting out of the Marines, I'm scared. I said, hey, I appreciate your honesty, and we're going to walk a journey together. But this is a place where it's okay to not be okay. It's a place where if you're hurting, it's okay to hurt. If you're confused, it's okay to be confused. If you're lost and trying to discover who God is and what his plan is, this is a safe place for you to journey in that journey. You see, if you're not okay, we want the church at Maltby and Monroe to be for you. And by becoming the church, if you make this your church home, we want your heart to shift for those who are not okay. Because Jesus came for those who are not okay. And this is a place where it's okay to not be okay. 
And too many times we spend too much valuable energy trying to assure others that we're okay. And we're really good at fake smiles. It's frustrating. My wife knows when I have a fake smile. She knows me. She sees me. She's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. She's like, no, you're not. I'm like, why did you ask then? And I'll smile. She's like, that's your fake smile. And I'll try a different smile. She's like, it's still fake. I was like, do we have to talk now? And she's like, yes. I'm like, okay. Um, you know. But here's the truth. Not only does my wife know, but Jesus knows when I'm faking it. And Jesus knows when you're faking it. And he's writing to a church that was faking it. They wanted to appear that they had the life with Jesus figured out. But they were dead. The Bible doesn't say they were just struggling. It says they were dead. Here's a couple signs that you are spiritually decaying or you are dead. First is this. Your faith has become routine. You've lost the awe that's found in being saved by grace and worshiping your Savior. You know the more familiar with something you can get, the more awe you can lose of it. I've lived in the state of Washington most of my life, except for four years, the Lord sent me to the wilderness in Missouri, but he brought me home. <laughs> it's funny, they say the mountains of Missouri. <laughs> the Ozark Mountains. And I was like, I, can't, I was missing mountains. I was like, I want to go to the Ozark Mountains. And we drove to them and we're like, we're here. I'm like, the South Hill of Puyallup was bigger than the Ozark Mountains. I was like, this is not a mountain. This is a green hill. Like, we could walk up it and not lose our breath. There is no ropes along a trail. There is nothing. It's a green hill. I was like, please do not ever call this a mountain. These are the hills of Ozark. And that is all I'll give them credit for. But have you ever seen Mount Rainier on a beautiful day? Man, I never get tired of it. I'm never like, uh, it's the mountain, 14,000 feet, no big deal, just sticks out. I'm like, I'm always like, wow, look how amazing and beautiful that is. In your relationship with Jesus, never lose the awe of who he is, of the grace he's given you. Don't do things out of obligation. But do things because the Spirit of God is leading you to be a part of his mission. Second way you might be, it might be dead or spiritually decaying. If your complaints are greater than your contribution. If your complaints are greater than your contribution, you might be spiritually dead. It's so easy to complain about a church or about a ministry. It's hard to contribute and make a difference. But if your contributions become greater than your complaints, God might actually use you to be the answer to your complaint. Think about that. Man, I just don't really like the way that is, or I wish we had this ministry, or I wish we did that. Good, God's speaking to you. Get on board and do it. His plan for you is that you would become the church, that you would become alive in the church. This church isn't made up of pastors and boards and everyone else. It's made up of the people of God doing the work of God for the purpose of God. And if we stray from that, we become dead. But being the people of God on the mission of God with the purpose of God makes us fully alive. And you, the best version of yourself is when you are serving with others and you're serving for others. And that's when you carry the heart of Jesus. Thirdly, if there's different versions of you at church, at home, and at work, you might be spiritually dead or decaying. See, when Jesus comes into your life, he wants to transform your whole life. And so that the best version of you is present at church, it's present at home, and it's present in the work. And if there's multiple versions of you, you're not allowing the Spirit of God to work in all of you. The Spirit of God should make you the best follower of Jesus. It should make you the best husband or wife or father or mother or friend. It should make you the best worker, the best employee, because it will transform all your ways of living and thinking. Fourthly, if you're giving lacks obedience and commitment, 
We're going to talk about money for just for a second. Why? Because money is a part of becoming spiritually alive in Jesus. The Bible declares that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And you can't be a part of the mission of God and be fully alive without being obedient in all areas. And part of that is finances. The Bible says we joyfully give to God. Not that we reluctantly give or we partially give or we give when it's convenient. Part of being fully alive is saying all of me, including my finances, are entrusted into God and his work. The scripture does not make it an option. It does not make it, hey, if you feel like giving or, hey, if it's compelling enough, it says no. If your life is given to Jesus, now your life is given to the work of Jesus. And the work of Jesus takes dollars. It does. Facilities, missions, outreaches, blessing people. It takes that. And if you want to become fully alive, you can't do it unless you're giving to the work of God. If, you're, if you say, I do everything else, but I don't give, you haven't become fully alive. And I don't just say this because the church budget needs it. I don't say this so Pastor Tim is less stressed. I, don't, I, I say this because giving makes you the best version of yourself. It matures you in your relationship with Jesus. And so become fully alive. And if any of these things are signs that, man, I might not be as alive as I think, Jesus has three encouragements for you that we find in the scripture. The first is this. He says, wake up. Wake up. And it's with urgency. It says, wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of God. Here's what wake up means. It means face the realities in front of you. Quit hiding, ignoring, and excusing what's killing you or has left you spiritually dead. It's like stepping on a scale. Oh, no. What happened? It's waking up to the realities before you and facing the facts. It says strengthen. This first instruction from Jesus tells them to strengthen what remains. Wherever you're at in your journey with Jesus, God has deposited something inside of you. And even if you haven't began a relationship with Jesus, you were created in the image of God. Formed in his likeness, created with a purpose, and that deposit is inside of you. So none of you are here without something from God in you. So strengthen what is there. Realize what is there. And the things which remain Tell us that though the spiritual condition of the church of Sardis was bad, it wasn't hopeless. And no matter how difficult life may seem or how far you may think you veered off the path, you are never without hope. So strengthen what remains. Isaiah 40, 31 tells us, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. Oh, yes, Lord, to run and not get weary. That is the dream of mine. I think about running and I get out of breath. But to run and not be weary, and they will walk and not faint. One of my favorite authors and speakers, his name's Bob Goff, says this. Faith isn't figuring out what we're able to do. It's deciding what we're going to do, even when we think we can't. Today you need to make a decision to strengthen what remains to strengthen what God has in you. Second thing Jesus said to this church is to remember. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. In verse 3, there's three commands. The first is this, to remember. Think about what you once were. If you're a follower of Jesus in here, think about the time when you would have seen yourself as most spiritually alive, as most spiritually vibrant, when you were on mission, when you were willing to take risks, and you were willing to step out in faith. The second thing is he says is obey. Simple. Stop disobeying. Don't pretend like you are unaware of sin, that laziness has taken over, or there's errors. See, because the truth is the choice to obey is up to me. God's word gives me clear direction for my life. God's word gives you clear direction, and the choice to obey is up to you. Thirdly, he says, repent. Change your ways. There is an opportunity for self-correction. You see, in repenting reverses the sin trend. 
Because we all get our lives in ruts, and even sin finds a way to get us in a rut of similar behavior. And when we repent, when we come to God, we say, God, this is not who you made me to be. I repent. I'm turning towards you. I'm turning away from sin. I'm turning towards you. And sin is this. Sin is missing the mark of God's perfect plan. If it's not in God's plan, it's sinful. If it's not in God's holy ways, it's sinful. Repenting is saying, I'm turning from that, and I'm coming to you. And he gives a warning. If you do not wake up, you will be caught off guard by my coming. Truth is, is Jesus is returning one day. Truth is, our life will run out of time one day. We'll pass from this earth. And at that moment, it's final. At that moment, whether you've known God and given God your life, whether you're fully alive or whether you're dead. And he says, don't be caught off guard. Make the decision today. It's never too late late to repent and obey. I have a friend who's a pastor in New York and has worked with youth, and he says this. There is nothing in this world more exhausting than trying to manage your own sin and manufacture your own righteousness. It's exhausting, and you'll fail every time. We simply place our lives at the feet of Jesus. We repent and turn to him. The last thing he says is this, walk. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. Walking with Jesus is just that. It's a journey. It's a daily decision when you wake up to give your life to him. It's not an event. It can be fueled by moments and moments, but day by day, it's staying in touch with who he is. And he uses this word, worthy. Now, I don't know about you, but there's days I don't feel worthy of all that I've received from God. But here's what makes you worthy. It's not you. It's walking with him makes you worthy. Walking with Jesus makes you worthy because it says that they'll be dressed in white. What's that white? White is the sign of righteousness. It's the sign of purity. And it's not something you earn. It's not something you can do. It's something that's given to you. Jesus says, if you're going to walk with me, I'm going to dress you in white. And I will call you worthy. Not because you're worthy, but because I'm worthy. And if you're with me, you're going to be like me. And it's the hope we have to walk with Jesus daily. The point is simple. If you're not walking with Jesus now, you won't be walking with him later. See, we live in an area, a nation that highly values tolerance of all people and all things. Our culture says that there's no absolute truth, which is an absolute, by the way. And one way is not better than another. And tolerance is the theme of today's culture says this, whatever is good for you and makes you happy should be fine by me. But this is compromise and completely false. Whatever may make you happy temporarily may also destroy your soul. The gospel compels and requires the church to love all people. But it calls us to bear with one another in love to come alongside one another, to carry each other's burdens, to say, hey, that's not the right path. This way is the right path. And the gospel burdens me not to become comfortable with people destroying their souls on a path of eternal separation from God. I'm not okay with that. My heart breaks for that. My heart breaks for people in our community that think that they can make whatever decision they want and they're still going to end up with Jesus forever. That's not the truth in Scripture. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. See, truth is absolute and God's word is truth. And failure to obey is disastrous. In verse 5 it says this, He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. And I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. The reward is worth the pain. The reward is worth the pain. In ancient times, cities like Sardis would have kept a register of their current citizens. And when a man or woman died, 
their name was removed from the book. It was blotted out. It was crossed out. It was erased. But Jesus is saying, if you want to remain on the role of God and spend eternity with God, you must strengthen your faith and walk with him. And the deadness of most of the Christians in Sardis was related to their impure lives and their willingness to embrace the impurity of the world and culture around them. But their only hope was to walk with Jesus, to become worthy because they're walking with him, and to overcome. Verse 6, it closes with this. It says this, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The challenge is to listen. To listen to the Spirit of God. I believe God uses preachers to help pinpoint or point you to some areas through Scripture. But your ultimate goal is to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And some of you even right now, God is speaking to you, saying, I love you and I've got a better way for you. There's some things that that need to change, but walk with me. And he will never guilt you. He will never shame you. But he gently and sweetly calls you to himself. That's the God we love and serve. That's the God that this church is passionately, passionate about and following with all our hearts. So here's the lessons as we close from Sardis, and I want to invite the worship team to come up. We see in this church that first off, Jesus knows when we're faking it. It's time to be real and stop faking it. Secondly, that when we repent, it reverses the sin trend. That you are one decision away from changing your life forever by giving it to God. Thirdly, the choice to obey is up to me. And fourthly, the reward is worth the pain. Following Jesus is a journey. And there's hard, treacherous, difficult times. But it's worth it. That day when you'll see your Savior face to face. When you'll be able to worship him for who he is and and, and with him, it's worth it. And I've got good news for you today. God is really good at bringing dead things to life. He's so good. He formed man out of the dust of the ground. And he breathed life into them. And God wants to breathe new life into you today. He wants you to be fully alive, to experience your best life, your best life in him. The world thought they could kill Jesus, crucified him in the most horrific way man has ever invented for someone to die. Hours of torture, pain, through suffocation on the cross. Mutilated his body, mocked him, treated him like the worst human on earth. Dead as dead could be. But what's dead in our eyes is not dead in God's eyes. Because three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. And now he lives and lives fully and wants to live in you and me. So I don't know what your journey's been. I don't know what your story's been. But I know this. God wants you to live. And he wants you to live in the fullness of him. He wants you to be filled with joy. He wants you to be filled with hope. He wants you to look at the future and say, there is a God that has a plan and a purpose for me. And whatever it takes, I'm going to walk that plan. I'm not going to live by fear. I'm going to live by faith. I'm not going to live with doubt. I'm going to live with trust. And this doesn't make you fake. It actually makes you real. And if we were a little real more often... I think we'd be a healthier church. Say, man, I'm just kind of struggling right now. Can you pray with me? Man, I'm just going through it. It hurts. Life's hard. I'm confused. I'm scared. Would you just pray with me? Would you come alongside me? But don't be a superhuman in faith. Because you can't. You simply just walk with Jesus and say, I'm going to live this out as best as I can. And when it's hard, I'm not going to do it alone. I'm going to call on Jesus. When it's great, I'm not going to do it alone. I'm still going to call on Jesus. And today, you have an opportunity. Whether you're here and you haven't begun that relationship with Jesus, and you would acknowledge, man, spiritually, there's not a lot in me. But today, I want to give my life to Jesus. That opportunity is for you. 
And God, through his grace and mercy, will meet you today and start you on a journey that will transform your life forever. Maybe you're here today and you gave your life to Jesus a long time ago. But you just acknowledge that, hey, maybe there was a time I was a little more alive in my faith than I am now. Maybe I've fallen into the routine. I show up, I serve, I put a smile on my face, but life is not really being lived with Jesus. There is great news for you today that God wants to breathe new life back in you. I've had that moment over and over and over again because we can be doing the right things, but if we're not doing it with the right heart, it's not the right thing. You can have the reputation of being spiritual without being spiritual. And that's a scary place to be. And not that your reputation will be found out, but you'll be living a powerless faith. So God's calling you. He's drawing you. 2,000 years ago to the church at Sardis, he says, you think you're so alive. But you and I both know it's not there. But his call to the church was strengthen. It wasn't to shame them. It wasn't to put them down. It was strengthen what remains. Remember where you were. Repent and obey. Put your eyes on eternity. Wake up. Don't be caught off guard. And that message is true for you and me today. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Revelation. God, we thank you for these letters to these churches. God, we thank you that these letters weren't just to these churches, but to the church at Maltby and to the, the church at Monroe. God, and we're here today with honest hearts saying, it doesn't matter what our reputation is. We want to be alive being led by the Spirit of God, doing the work of God in specific times and specific places that you are preparing us for. And God, not just corporately as a church, but for these individuals, for these men, women, young adults, teenagers in this room. God, may they all know that they're fully loved by you and that you desire for them to walk with you and that walking with you is what will make them worthy. Not how they feel about themselves, but God, but getting a full picture of who you are. We pray that we'd walk with you. We'd be obedient to you. And God, that when we look at our spiritual condition in areas where we have to face the facts and say, I'm not being who God needs me to be, that we would repent and change. We would come to you. If you're here today and you say, man, I just want to begin that journey. I want to invite Jesus into my life to make me spiritually alive. If that's you here today, would you just, with every head bowed and every eye closed, just as a moment between you and God, and I want to pray for you, would you just raise your hand right now? See, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. Awesome. Thank you. You can put it down. Thank you. Cool. Secondly, if you're here and say, man, there's some areas in my life that if I'm honest about them, they're not spiritually alive. And today, I want to just repent and tell Jesus, Jesus, I am yours, and I want to be fully alive in you. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Many of us, my hand's raised. There's times I need to just fully give my life to Jesus. Let's pray. God, for those that just raised their hands, God, I pray, God, that your heart would move towards them. God, that your compassion would be shown on them. God, that even now they would sense that you are doing a work in them. God, to bring them fully alive. God, may this church be in the best, healthiest place it's ever been because people are acknowledging it's okay to not be okay, but I'm not okay to stay not okay. And I'm going to pursue Jesus, and I'm going to go after him. And God, we pray that we would just be fully alive in you. In Jesus' precious name.